Hiya six. Hi, Year 6, and welcome to today's home learning. Now, today we're going to read as much of Chapter 6 as we can, and we'll probably come quite close to the end. And then tomorrow we're going to finish the chapter, and then you'll have an activity to do at the end. But today we're just going to read quite a bit of the chapter as we continue Chapter 6. And obviously we know that the Hobbit and the Dwarves have just escaped the mountains, and now they're trying to find their way through the lands beyond. Must we go any further? asked Bilbo, when it was so dark that he could only just see Thorin's beard wagging behind him, and so quiet that he could hear all the dwarves breathing like a loud noise. My toes are all bruised and bent, and my legs ache, and my stomach is wagging like an empty sack. A bit further, said Gandalf. After what seemed ages further, they came suddenly to an opening where no trees grew. The moon was up and was shining into the clearing. Somehow, it struck all of them as not at all a nice place, although there was nothing wrong to see. All of a sudden, they heard a howl away downhill, a long, shuddering howl. It was answered by another away to the right and a good deal nearer to them, then by another not far away to the left. It was wolves howling at the moon, wolves gathering below. There was no wolves living near Mas near Mr Baggins's hole at home, but he knew that noise. He had had it described to him often enough in tales. One of the elder cousins, on the Took side, who had been a great traveller, used to imitate it to frighten him. To hear it out in the forest under the moon was not too much for Bilbo. Even magic rings are not much use against wolves, especially against the evil packs that lived under the shadow of the goblin-infested mountains, over the edge of the wild on the borders of the unknown. Wolves of that sort smell keener than goblins and do not need to see you to catch you. What shall we do? What shall we do? He cried. Escaping goblins to be caught by wolves, he said. And it became a proverb, though we now say, out of the frying pan, into the fire, in the same sort of uncomfortable situations. Up the trees quick, cried Gandalf, and they ran to the trees at the edge of the glade, hunting for those that had branches fairly low, or were slender though, to swarm up. They found them as quick as ever they could, you can guess, and up they went as high as ever they could trust the branches. You would have laughed from a safe distance if you had seen the dwarves sitting up to the, in the trees with their beards dangling down, like old gentlemen gone cracked and playing at being boys. Billy and Killy were at the top of a la tall, large like an enormous Christmas tree. Dory, Nori, Ori, Oin and Goloin were more comfortable in a huge pine with regular branches sticking out at intervals like it the spokes of a wheel. Biffa, Boffa, Bomba and Thorin were in another. Dwarin and Barlin had swarmed up a tall slender fir with branches and were trying to find a place to sit in the greenery of the topmost boughs. Gandalf, who was a good deal taller than the others, had found a tree into which they could not climb, a large pine standing at the very edge of the glade. He was quite hidden in its boughs, but you could see his eyes gleaming in the moon as he peeped out. And Bilbo, he could not get into any tree and was scuttling from trunk to trunk like a rabbit that had lost its hole and has a dog after it. You've left the burglar behind again, said Nori to Dory, looking down. I can't be always carrying burglars on my back, said Dory. Down tunnels and up trees, what do you think I am? A porter. He'll be eating if we don't do something, said Thorin. But there were howls all around now, getting nearer and nearer. Dory, he called, for Dory was lowest down in the easiest tree. Be quick and give Mr Baggins a hand up. Dory was really a decent fellow, in spite of his grumbling. Poor Bilbo could not reach his hand even when he climbed down to the bottom branch and hung his arms down as fast as he could. So Dory actually climbed out of the tree and let Bilbo scramble up and stand on his back. Just at that moment, the wolves trotted, howling into the clearing. All of a sudden, there were hundreds of eyes looking at them. Still, Dory did not let Bilbo down. He waited till he clambered off his shoulders and into the branches, and then he jumped for the branches himself, only just in time. A wolf snapped at his cloak as he swung up and nearly got him. In a minute, there were a whole pack of them yelping all around the tree and leaking, leaping up at the trunk, with eyes blazing and tongues hanging out. But even the wild wargs, for so the evil wolves over the edge of the wild were named, cannot climb trees. For a while they were safe. Luckily, it was warm and not windy. Trees are not very comfortable to sit in for a long time, but in the cold and the wind, with wolves 
all around below waiting for you, they can be perfectly miserable places. This glade in the ring of trees was evidently a meeting place of the wolves. More and more kept coming in. They left guards at the foot of the tree in which Dorian and Bilbo were, and then went snuffing around till they had smelt out every tree that stood around it. These they guarded too, while all the rest, hundreds and hundreds it seemed, went and sat in a great circle in the glade, and in the middle of the circle was a great grey wolf. He spoke to them in a dreadful language of the wargs. Gandalf understood it. Bilbo did not, but it sounded terrible to him, and as if all their talk was about cruel and wicked things, as it was. Even now and then all the wargs in the centre would answer their grey chief altogether, and their dreadful clamour almost made the hobbit fall out of his pine tree. I tell you what Gandalf heard, though Bilbo did not understand it. The wargs and the goblins often helped one another in wicked deeds. Goblins do not usually venture very far from the mountains, unless they are driven out and are looking for a new home, or are marching to war, which I am glad to say has not happened for a long time. But in those days they sometimes used to go on raids, especially to get food or slaves to work for them. Then they often got the wargs to help and shared the plunder with them. Sometimes they rode on wargs like men do on horses. Now it seemed that a great goblin raid had been planned for the very night. The wargs had come to meet the goblins, and the goblins were late. The reason, no doubt, was the death of the great goblin, and all the excitement caused by the dwarves and Bilbo and the wizard, for whom they were probably still hunting. In spite of the dangers so far, land bold men had of late in spite of the dangers of this far land, bold men had of late had been making their way back into the south cutting down trees and building themselves places to live in among the more pleasant woods in the valleys and along the river shores. There were many of them, and they were brave and well armed, and even the wargs dared not attack them if there were many together or in the bright of day. But now they had planned with the goblins' help to come by night upon the villages nearest the mountains. If their plan had been carried out, there'd have been none left the next day. All would have been killed except the few the goblins kept from the wolves and carried back as prisoners to their caves. This was dreadful talk to listen to, not only because of the brave woodmen and their wives and children, but also because of the danger which now threatened Gandalf and his friends. The wargs were angry and puzzled at finding them here in the very meeting place. They thought they were friends of the woodmen and were come to spy on them, and would take news of their plans down into the valleys, and then the goblins and wolves would have a fight, a terrible battle, instead of capturing prisoners and devouring people waked suddenly from their sleep. So the wargs have no intention of going away, and letting the people up the tree escape. At any rate, not until morning. And long before that, they said, goblin soldiers would be coming down from the mountains. And goblins can climb trees, or cut them down. Now you can understand why Gandalf, listening to their growling and yelping, began to be dreadfully afraid, wizard though he was, and to feel that they were in a very bad place, and had not yet escaped at all. All the same, he was not going to let them have it all their own way that he could not do very much stuck up in tall tree with wolves all around on the ground below. He gathered the huge pine cones from the branches of the trees. Then he let out light with a bright blue fire and threw it whizzing down among them in the circle of the wolves. It struck one on the back and immediately his shaggy coat caught fire and he was leaping to and fro, yelping horribly. Then another came and another, one in blue flames, one in red, another in green. They burst on the ground in the middle of the circle and went off in coloured sparks and smoke. The especially large one hit the chief wolf on the nose and he leaped in the air ten feet and then rushed round and round the circle, biting and snapping even at the other wolves in his anger and fright. The dwarves and Bilbo shouted and cheered. The rage of the wolves was terrible to see and the commotion they made filled all the forest. Wolves are afraid of fire at all times, but this was the most horrible and uncanny fire. If a spark got in their coat, it stuck and burned into them, and unless they rolled over quick, they were made soon in flames. Very soon, all about the glade, wolves were rolling over and over to put out the sparks on their backs. And while those that were burning and running about howling and setting others alight, till their own friends chased them away, and they fled off down the slopes crying and yammering and looking for water. What is this uproar in the forest tonight? said the forest lord of the eagles. He was sitting black in the moonlight on the top of a lonely pinnacle of rock at the eastern edge of the mountains. I hear wolves, voices, are the goblins at mischief in the woods? 
He swung up in the air and immediately two of his guard from the rocks at either hand leaped up to follow him. They circled up in the sky and looked down upon the ring of walks, a tiny spot far, far below. But eagles have keen eyes and can sm see small things at a great distance. The lord of the eagles of the Misty Mountains had eyes that could look at the sun unblinking and could see a rabbit moving on the ground a mile below even in the moonlight. So though he could not see the people in the trees, he could make out the commotion among the wolves and see the tiny flashes of fire and hear the howling and yelping come up faint from far beneath him. And he could see the glint of the moon on goblin spears and helmets as long lines of wicked folk crept down the hillsides from their gates and wound into the wood. Eagles are not kindly birds. Some are cowardly and cruel. But the ancient race of the northern mountains were the greatest of all birds. They were proud and strong and noble-hearted. They did not love goblins or fear them. When they took any notice of them at all, which was seldom, for they did not eat such creatures, they swooped on them and drove them shrieking back to their caves and stopped whatever wickedness they were doing. The goblins hated the eagles and feared them, but could not reach their lofty seats or drive them from the mountains. Tonight the Lord of the Eagles was filled with curiosity to know what was afoot, so he summoned many other eagles to him, and they flew away from the mountains, and slowly circling ever round and round, they came down, 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 towards the ring of the wolves and the meeting place of the goblins. A very good thing too. Dreadful things had been going on down there. The wolves that had caught fire and fled into the forest had set it alight in several places. It was high summer, and on this eastern side of the mountains there had been little rain for some time. Yellow bracken, fallen branches, deep piled pine needles, and here and there dead trees were soon in flames. All around the clearing of the walks, fire was leaping, but the wolf guards did not leave the trees. Maddened and angry, they were leaping and howling round the trunks, and cursing the dwarves in their horrible language, with their tongues hanging out, and their shiny eyes as red and fierce as the flames. Then suddenly goblins came running up, yelling, they bought a battle with the woodman was going on, but they soon learned what had really happened. Some of them actually sat down and laughed. Others waved their spears and clashed the shafts against their shields. Goblins are not afraid of fire, and soon they had a plan which seemed to them most amusing. Some got all the wolves together in a pack. Some stacked fern and brushwood around the tree trunks. Others rushed around and stamped and beat and beat and stamped until nearly all the flames were put out. But they did not put out the nearest fire, to the trees where the dwarves were. That fire they fed with leaves and dead branches and bracken. Soon they had a ring of smoke and flame all around the dwarves, a ring which they kept from spreading outwards, but it closed slowly in, till the running fire was licking the fuel piled under the trees. Smoke was in Bilbo's eyes. He could feel the heat of the flames, and though the reek, through the reek he could see the goblins dancing round and round in a circle, like people round a midsummer bonfire. Outside the ring of dancing warriors were spears and axes stood the wolves at a respectful distance, watching and waiting. He could hear the goblins beginning a horrible song. Fifteen birds in a fir five trees, their feathers were planned in a fiery breeze. But funny little birds, they had no wings. Oh, what shall we do with the funny little things? Roast them alive or stew them in a pot, fry them, boil them and eat them hot. Then they stopped and shouted out, Fly away, birds! Fly away if you can! Come down, little birds, or you get roasted in your nests! Sing, sing, little birds! Why don't you sing? Go away, little boys! shouted Gandalf in answer. It isn't bird nesting time, and also, naughty little boys that play with fire get punished, he said it, to make them angry, and to show them that he was not frightened of them. Though of course he was. Wizard though he was. But they took no notice, and they went on singing. Burn, burn, tree and fern, shrivel and scorch a fizzling torch, to light the night for our delight, yeah hey. Bake and toast them, fry them and roast them, till beards blaze and eyes glaze, till hair smells and skin crack, fat melts and bones black, and cinders lie beneath the sky, so dwarves shall die, and light the night for our delight, yeah hey. Ya Harry, hey, ya hey. And with the Ahoy, the flames were under Gandalf's tree. 
In a moment, it spread to the others. The bark caught fire, the lower branches cracked. Then Gandalf climbed to the top of the tree. The sudden splendour flashed from his wand like lightning as he got ready to spring down on high, right above the spears of the goblins. That would have been the end of him, though he would probably have killed many of them as he came hurtling down like a thunderbolt. But he never leaped. Just at the moment, the Lord of the Eagles swept down from above, seized him in his talons, and was gone. Okay, we're going to stop there today. So, obviously Gandalf and the Dwarves and Bilbo have run into another big problem. But the Eagles have come, so maybe they might find them a way out. We'll read on and finish and find out what happens tomorrow. <laughs>